your nature has been compromised by evil people who have punished you, embarrassed you, imprisoned you, enslaved you, and did a lot of things to you that they couldn't survive. But here you stand today. You stand under the power of being in the image of God. I tell black women, it could be the, the closest to God you ever get is being with a black man because you are in the image of God. And that's been the big secret. Mm. It's to make you think that you are less than God and that you had no power, authority or power on the earth. You are in the image of God. You act like God. God made you first. You're the best. You're the wisest. You're the most beautiful. You've just been under some people that made you lose your way. And now it's, you have become resistant to resistance because they have used money to define your character. And if you don't have that, they've taught us, as your women, they've taught us to judge you by that. As I said, they have made you accountable for delivering things that they wouldn't let you get and still don't. And if you're getting any big money from a white company, you done gave up yourself totally. You don't have mm. no self left if you got a big job with them. Because the requirement is that you have to give up self. That's a fact. Your goals in your life, you have to do it. And the men are different today. You know, men are... Uh... So, you shouldn't work for the white men, but black women should sacrifice for black men and the community, but black men shouldn't work. <laughs> One, two, three, to the Nicki Minaj blink. <laughs> I probably shouldn't start such a serious topic with Nicki Minaj, but here we go. Hey everyone. Welcome back to Thema Sento. Grab your coffee, water, tea, whatever you're drinking, go and get that. Today, we're going to watch and respond to Shahrazad Ali on Ren and Stimpy Girl, Ren and Stimpy Show. They interviewed Shahrazad Ali, and I think there are some important things that we need to get into, so let's do it. Not drinking that, that is definitely too hot. Before we get to the video, right, I think it is important that we know who this lady is, right? I think it is important that subscribers, that viewers recognize who we're talking about. So for those who do not know Miss Ali, here are some bangers. <laughs> here are just some bangers over, over the year of Shahrazad's beliefs. So let's do it. All right, let's start with Black Women's Rebellion is the cause for the breakdown in the Black family. Let's, let's hear it. My position is that the Black woman's disrespect and rebellion against the leadership and the authority of the Black man is the direct cause of the breakdown in our black family structure. Now, of course, there are many black people who consider those fighting words because as black women, we have never been subject to the kind of examination uh, that our men have been subject to since we have been here. We have been somewhat protected and shielded from any kind of critiquing about our personal behavior. So black women, have been protected and shielded from any kind of critique. I'm not going to respond to these. I'm just trying to give you a, cl a, a kind of cliff note version of what Shaharazad Ali has been uh, advocating over the past, I don't know how long. So th that's one, right? <clears throat> now, let's go to how <laughs> black women cause men to not focus on their future. Let let's hear that. I have charged that we nag our men too much. We keep our men's head tied up so much when our petty grievances about our personal relationship that he don't have time to think and plan for our future. Because he got to deal with what's going to happen with us every day. You know, it's, it's real life. When a black man come home, he almost have to do a wind test or stick his toe in the door. He don't know what's waiting. He don't know who in that day. He know it's a possibility that there's some kind of new monster that he didn't even know about yesterday. <laughs> So, you know, we, we need to not make it like that. We need to not be so vicious with our mouth. And if you thought Fresh and Fit of Myron book, Why Women Deserve Less, was the first time that idea that black women in particular, but he said women, deserve less, then you have not been listening to Shaharazad Ali when she talked about how black women should be satisfied with less. So let's hear that. A lot of times our men look at us and know that he ain't never going to be able to make enough money to give us all of the things we say we want. 
And don't no man want to be with a woman who he constantly got to deny her the things that she says she wants. And that represents failure to him, to have to always, you know, not be able to provide us for what we ask for. One of the ways we can do that is to start being satisfied with less. So not only, by the way, should you be satisfied with less because in her mind, black men can provide more, you should also be willing to form the same group of men who she believes cannot provide, because she just explained that you should settle for less and be satisfied with less because of the system and all of that, right? But then she says, you need to be willing to share your man, your black man in particular. Let, let, let me play that, let me, let me play that for you. Non-possessive loving is not an easy one for us to practice. And uh, of course, I have a lot of sisters and some brothers who are in disagreement with me saying that. But the actual fact is that our men are outnumbered about five to one. And nature is going to require that the men take responsibility for more than one woman and her children. Most of our men have children by more than one woman anyway. So I don't know why that was such a surprise, allegedly, when I said that. The black man has not been waiting on me to tell him he could have more than one woman. No. I'm in agreement with the rest of y'all. I don't think he should do that, but I fail like you did. There are some things perhaps about the nature of our man that we have been given some definitions about that are not true. So you should be willing to share your man because they're going to cheat anyway. So instead of letting him cheat, just or being worried about him cheating, rather. Instead of worrying about him cheating, just share him. That, that, that's the solution. Now, the lack of economics in terms of the ability to provide for oneself and one's family is expressed by Shaharazad Ali when it comes to black men. But the solution for the, the inability for black men to provide is that black women should settle for less and want less. And not only should you want less, you should be willing to share the man who cannot provide sufficiently for you and your children so he can go and make more children somewhere else. G now, on top of all of that, we're going to compound that with this little nugget right here. Let, let's play this. We have a man who everybody hates. <clears throat> we hate him, his mama hates him, his family hates him, the white police hates him, the regular white men and white women hate him. This is a man who is hated by everyone. The only solace that God made for him was us. And when he comes to us and can't get any sanctuary at all, then he don't have no life. And th then they win because what they want to do is to destroy him and make us think that we are better than him so that we will help the enemy destroy our own man that God gave us. We have the best man on earth. Everybody want him. He looked better than everybody. He's stronger than everybody. He is the best, the wisest, and the most beautiful. Now, of course, many of our men have been tricked by the enemy too. But since we are the mothers, we are the first face they see. We are the first person they talk to. We're the first person to feed them. We do all of that and raise them up. And so if there's a silly man out here, he didn't grow up and be silly. He was silly as a little boy because his mother mismanaged him and didn't reparent him using the truth. Wow, now, true. what we're dealing with is a man who has been wounded and repressed and taught that he does not have any value. And their solution to keeping him in that condition is to convince us to tell him he ain't got no value. And many wow. of us do that. Many of us do that because we're disappointed. You know, we, uh, I've been talking with the brothers about trying to uh, get in touch with or make peace with their fathers. Because many of our people who didn't have a father, we have that father hunger. And almost everything we know about our father was told to us by our mother who was mad at him about their relationship. Wow. It has nothing to do with us being their child and them being our father. Fatherhood is not based on whether or not he can pay child support or not. Mm. We mm. don't care as children. Mm. You can't find a child that care whether the father gives them anything. They want their daddy. Yes. And we have deprived them of that based on some rules that white people set up. And we will tell people he don't do nothing for him, so I don't let him see him. Mm. And that is the worst thing. That's not hurting the man as much as it's hurting our own child. The fact that they're all up there like shaking their head and talking about preach is wild. <laughs> that is well. Here's why, here's why, here's why. Because the man is not in the home, can he not be a parent? Who is keeping these men away from their children? By the way, this is a segment in the actual um, interview that I will refer back to regarding why men stop coming to visit, or going, rather, to visit their children. And it doesn't, the research doesn't indicate that it has to do with the mother keeping them away. It actually has to do with them just stopping, generally, or when they get in a new relationship and have a new child, new being the operative word there, they voluntarily don't engage with their children or child from a previous relationship. So, 
this is jumbled in a way that is really annoying, and I'm not going to dissect all the women and what they had to say about any of this. So, like, let's keep the ball rolling, because I do actually want y'all to hear her talk about housing for single mothers and not men. Yeah, you know, we have some serious relationship problems that nobody has been able to address us on because everybody wants to pretend that this is not going on. You know, over 60% of our women are single, widowed, separated, or divorced. They don't have a man. I just came out of Florida and they got a housing complex that the Urban League built, which is a black organization that is for women and children only. They, don't, they say they don't allow any men in there. I didn't have time to deal with it, but I talked about them real bad. That's the silliest program I've ever heard of. You know the women that had men if they got a bunch of children. They need fathers. They need protection. We hear about the drug problem that we have in our projects across the country. It's one of the major places that we have a drug problem. You know, we talk about the great strength that we have as black women. Well, the uh, welfare department don't rent government apartments to single black men. Those apartments belong to black women who are allowing this to go on in their home. We have not looked at what part of the responsibility do we share. Yes, black men sell a lot of drugs, and a lot of us black women get the money from them drugs and buy some of these fancy clothes we wear, drive around in some of these fancy cars. He is not doing these things alone and without support from us, whether they are good or bad. See, we have a lot of power. We are very strong women. I'm saying that we're using our strength in the wrong direction. We're using it to tear our man down, tear our nation down, instead of building it up. Having an education and a job is not, does not necessarily mean you have a successful life. So here, she talks about the Urban League and not men not being able to live with their family. I don't want to go through this entire video. But this is wild, not only because of, well, who is taking care of these children? And welfare generally applies not just to women, but also to men. And so they, this is a tad bit convoluted from my perspective, and I'm not sure what she's referencing. But anyway, let's push forward, because the idea that men are selling dope, let's call it, and giving the money to women, and the women are the ones spending the money, seems to suggest that, they, <laughs> that the women are the cause for these men's behavior. And that's like a wild claim to be making. Like, it, it doesn't matter. Let's move on. I'm just introducing y'all to who she is. So let's play one more. And we have been given the false compliment that we are the backbone of the black nation. There is no doubt in any community in this country that the men in those communities are the backbone of their nations. There's no doubt in the white community that the white man is the backbone of his nation. The European, the Buddhist, the Korean, the Japanese, the Hispanic, all of those men are the backbones of their community and there's no doubt about it. It is only in the black community where those values have been transposed and where they put that burden on us and tell us that we are the backbone of the black community, which is a direct insult to the black man and implies that he don't have no backbone and that his women have to represent him. I remind people all the time that God did not make the white man, the white woman, the black woman, and then the black man. He made the black man first and he created all the rest of the people after him. There's a couple of things here. I feel like she's trying to say women are the rib of men and so I'm not even going to get it. I think she's trying to say women are the rib of men. I'm not even going to get into that. Don't know what this is about, saying he created men, women first as well, when scientific evidence suggests that women were the first. But regardless, believe what you believe. I'm not here to engage in that kind of debate around your religion and what you believe about men and women and divinity. At least not yet, right? The idea that people are saying black women are the backbone of the community as an insult to black men is kind of wild because it's like, just looking at the community and seeing who is picking up the pieces, who is raising the children, who is providing, who is at the church, who, um, it, let's use Dr. Umar, even though he might not be the best example of where you should invest money. Black women are the ones are paying and, and donating to him to build a school. Black women tend to be the people that engage in these kinds of, uh, of economic development through donation, right? Like, so when people say black women are the backbone of the black community, I feel like this is an attempt to highlight what is happening in the black community, as opposed to make up some reality to make black men feel bad. Like, that is wild. But we cannot go on without reading a... <laughs> I feel like we can't go on if I don't read an excerpt from her book, right? So let me pull this excerpt. I'm going to put the, hopefully it's flashing across the screen, right? And this is what, what she says. There is never an excuse for hitting a woman. Pause. Her saying there's never an excuse for hitting a woman, I thought I would be on board. I feel like there should be a period full stop there. But nah, that's not what she was doing. That's not, let, let me read this for you. There is never an excuse for hitting a woman anywhere but in the mouth, right? So she is saying you shouldn't hit a woman unless you're hitting her in, the, in her mouth. Go, go what? 
let put it back up, let's finish this. <clears throat> because it is from that hole in the lower part of her face that all her rebellion culminates into words. Her unbridled tongue is a main reason she cannot get along with the black man. She often needs a reminder. This does not mean that she needs or wants to be battered or beaten to a bloody pulp. So you can beat her, just not to a bloody pulp. But you can definitely hit her in the mouth. It's what sh Shaharazad Ali was advocating in her book about the black man's guide to understanding the black woman. Let's continue, put that back. However, if she ignores the authority and superiority of the black man, there is a penalty. When she crosses this line and becomes viciously insulting, it is time for the black man to soundly slap her in the mouth. This lady is advocating for domestic violence. This lady is advocating for domestic violence, and it's interesting because she's being paraded all around the manosphere as if she is kind of the person we should listen to in terms of how relationships should, should operate, where she's saying men should be able to hit women. Like, what do you mean? So that's what we're... Anyway, so she said, apparently she's about to retire or something, and she went on Ren and Stimpy to do an interview. And today, we are going to go through the interview. Now, before we start, I think it's important to note her thesis. So let me play her thesis for y'all, and then I'll explain what she's saying. The black man and the black woman in America have a problem. They do not get along. Before the black man can devise a, a solution, he must know the components of the problem. The first factor is that the black woman is out of control. She does not submit to gu guidance by her God-given mate, the black man. Her intention to overpower and subdue the black man is motivated by several factors, the most prevalent being her self-inflicted, nearly psychotic insecurity. Her disrespect for the black man is a direct cause of the destruction of the black family. And when I read that first page, I knew that this was about to be a rod. Right. <laughs> her thesis... She believes the black men and the black women have a problem. They do not get along. And the reason she don't think they get along is because black women will just not submit. That she thinks black women should just submit to black men and that would solve the problem in the community. She claims that black women are out of order. She claims further that the black woman's disrespect for the black man is the cause of the destruction of the black family. Not abandonment, no, not slavery, not lack of economic resources, not lack of education, not the prison industrial complex. No, it is the black woman's lack of control. Mind you, black women aren't the one out here unaliving people. They aren't the one out here abandoning their children in large number or engaging in criminal activities or getting put in prison or being unalive generally. Like they are not the one causing the problem in the community. But in her mind, it's because the black woman is out of control that causes the breakdown in the black fam family. Not the direct cause, which is the abandonment from the father, right? The absence of the father is the direct cause of the broken, quote unquote, family. But no, 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 why would you blame the man who is no longer there who left? You're gonna blame the woman for being out of control. All right, so that's the thesis. The black woman is out of control. Her disrespect for the black man is what causes the destruction of the black family. The rule is that black women need to follow black men for the community to be better. Now, I feel like in the back of our minds, we should test this theory as we go through. Should black women just follow black men and in so doing, solve the issue in the black community? Will men stop abandoning their families? Will they be able to work and provide and prevent the unaliving of other groups of men, women, and children in the black community? Is that, will that allow black men to fight and push back against white supremacy? I don't know, but Shaharazad Ali believes that. So we will watch this video together, and then we will get into a discussion, hopefully, about who is right and who is wrong in the conclusion of this video. So let's get into analyzing the interview. Now, and see, that's the thing is, you know, the conversation of this gender war I thought it was a new conversation because I hear people talking about the gender war all the time now. You know, black men and black women are fighting, blah, 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 blah. And I thought a lot of it had to do with social media, like you said, and what we see on a day-to-day -day basis. But has there always been a gender war and a rift even going back to the 80s between black men and black women? Uh, I think it is. Before she answers this question, he thought the gender war was a new phenomenon. 
when I, I'm trying to figure out when he learned that this was not in fact a new phenomenon. Like this was not a new thing. This has been going on for forever. Do you do like no research? Do they? I feel like these men just like pop up and like don't actually engage in like meaningful work. They just start talking. They 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 can express nothing beyond their lived experience. So their 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 feedback, their review of culture, their conversations around history is very limited if the only perspective you have is your own lived experience. Like you have to go into the research. The fact that you're sitting up here not knowing that in the 1970s, for example, there was this conversation happening. Like let, 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 let's, let, let's go to the 1970s. The feeling of racial pride is not new for many African Americans, but the resurgence of black awareness and pride, black men and women face new problems, not only in relation to white society, but to each other in a black society. Recently, there has been a stream of articles on this subject, and the Chicago Daily Defender, America's largest black newspaper, began a series some weeks ago on the emergence of the new black woman. Betty Washington, reporter for the paper, surveyed the Chicago scene to report on how black men and women believe the revolution in racial pride will affect them and their families before the sociologists and experts tell us how we are supposed to react. Not only were sociologists and, quote, experts discussing the issues in the black community between black men and black women, like, we also have in, like, the 1980s, clips from the 1980s, where black women and men were talking about how black men and black women lost their togetherness. Let me play this for you also. Carolyn, you had a question. I just wonder why sometimes, um, often black men choose white women over black women. I don't understand that. Well, I think that that's very uh, easily answered by the fact that we still live in a world where we base images or beauty off Europeans. In other words, if America defines beauty as light skin, long hair and blue eyes, haven't they told you what ugly is? There are still people, even in this audience, using terms like good hair. Not only do, are they discussing black women and black men and black men dating out and black women being concerned at this time with black men dating out, there were also questions around how black women could be better for black men. Here's it, because people were talking about how black women needed to be black men's inspiration to be and do better. Here, here you go. And as black women, we have to be the inspiration for the nation, for our men. We have to start out into the community educating the children, educating ourselves. Because once we educate ourselves, the children will become educated because we, we are the ones that teach the children. We are the ones that decorate the homes. We are the ones that are with both female and male children. We are the ones that the children look to as the image in terms of their daily education. So it is important <coughs> that we don't get our values mixed up and feel that we have to educate the world. We haven't first educated ourselves. Ooh, it's still always God. a self yeah, thing. Sure. Indeed. I'm not dissecting this about the male and female children, so there's no responsibility on the man for the male child. I'm, I'm gonna ignore all of that because this is not the analysis. I'm not analyzing these videos. I'm using these videos to show that there was a conversation about black women and men happening way back when. In Jamaica, we would say from Wapikil Philip. <laughs> from Wapikil Philip, girl, there was, there was a conversation happening. Now, it's interesting though, while black women were talking about improving themselves and becoming an inspiration for black men and the nation and going to school and be educated because if you educate a woman, you educate a nation and this education will pass on to their children. If it is interesting to go back to that specific video while black men are online in the manosphere, not all black men, mind you, this is not all. And I need to say that because of all the emails I keep getting, I'm never talking about all. However, these ones who are speaking with very loud microphones are talking about your education does not matter. Meanwhile, black women were trying to get educated in an effort to educate their nation and their children, and black men are pushing back, saying education don't matter. Interestingly, again, is the question of while black women were getting educated, what were black men doing? Oh my God, I forgot that was Cersei and that is so disgusting. Anyway, let's continue because even Dr. Frances Cress Wilson had something to say in the 1970s. So let's hear her and then we'll close out by touching on, on Malcolm X right after. Uh, any place, you name it, that as long as the people of color are the people who are oppressed, then when a marriage occurs, in other words, a dominator says, I will pick you amongst the victims who I dominate to marry you, then the victim says, oh goody, this means I'm in. Well, that's true, but uh, I, I, if I can ask this question. Okay. It seems, the way you are framing your analysis, mm -hmm. that the almost total blame, if we can use that word, for interracial marriages is because of, one, white society, this or this, white supremacy. Seeking to maintain itself. And two, white women being the aggressors. You seem to 
uh, be saying, and I'm asking a question, mm -hmm. that uh, black men are just uh, blameless and uh, they're sort of like the victims of something that they have no control over or that they have no need to be married to a white woman for some perhaps pathological basis? No, let's say, for example, if you set up the conditions for the development of a sadomasochistic relationship, then the masochist as well as the sadist is a part of that relationship. And they are playing roles that they have been conditioned to play. In other words, a person who is a masochist seeks out the sadist because then they could play uh, their sort of dual game. Mutual reciprocity. Their mutual reciprocity together. Now, within the dynamic of the system of white supremacy, you have, for example, many of the white women who are with black and other non-white men are actually, I believe, having a dialogue with white men. How does that work? See, the dialogue goes like this according to my analysis. First of all, the white women, we have the women's liberation movement, which is a dynamic of white females, okay? They are asking for liberation out from under the white male. All right, now within the dynamic of the white supremacy culture, you also have penis envy. In other words, the white men have been perceived as being dominant over the woman. And so the woman says, well, I wish I had a penis. Okay, so what does she do? She says, well, I'll go out and get one that's supposed to be more powerful than yours, but I'm going to control it because we are white and we control all of the non-whites. So she goes out and she selects, and all this is unconscious, mm -hmm. you know, activity, if you will. She goes out and selects a non-white male, be he black or any other non-white. Then she is walking down the street, or they can go to the, you know, uh, justice of the peace or the priest or be married. And any time a white man sees that, she is communicating to him, see, I've got one because I am in control of this. Mm -hmm. So that was the, Dr. Francis Cresswell saying, talking about interracial marriage and it being a tool and a weapon all of that, right? Again, not analyzing any of this really. I'm just showing because Red and Stimpy seem to not have known this conversation is a very old, dusty one, right? They thought it was new and they're having the conversation as if it were new. So they're not learning from the past. They're not really engaging in rigor at all around the conversation they seem to want to lead online. Like, how are you not aware? Do Let's go to Malcolm X, because even if you didn't know fully what was happening during the civil rights movement during the 1960s, right, you should have known like the, the famous Malcolm X quote about black women being unprotected generally. But here's another clip that I think is important, and I'll just add it here. And hopefully Ren and Stimpy will never ever be ignorant again to the fact of the conversation that has existed before they were born. And now you know you need someone to teach you to respect your woman. You say, well, what about the white woman? No, you've been respecting her. Every time you see a Negro man, he got his head off, showing his teeth to some pale-skinned white woman. And the mistake that you and I have made is leaving our women unprotected. Anybody can get to her. Anybody can abuse her. Any old white man can come and pat a black woman. Can he not? And we are teaching the white man keep his hands and his eyes off our women. So even Malcolm X was talking about the sort of interracial dynamics. You all know the famous speech about the most unprotected woman. So, I'm not sure where these two men are sitting up there talking about, oh, they didn't know this conversation was older and they thought it was new. So that's the first thing. And the question he's asking didn't even come out yet because of how the, the, the lack of knowledge on the topic that they're attempting to discuss is wild. I will give them the benefit of the doubt and say they knew and already have known this is an old dusty conversation, but they wanted to start off feigning ignorance. I'm gonna assume that, which makes them intellectually dishonest, so I guess I'm not giving them any real credit then, am I? Anyway, let's continue. I think it uh, came to a head about there being an issue between us in the 60s, when the white woman came up with the women's liberation movement. And unfortunately, as black men and black women in this country, even our children, whatever white people problems are, we try to do our own version of that problem. We don't set our own agenda as a rule. We follow behind them. And so when they came up with that, uh, the white woman was not in a sisterhood with us and she was angry with the white man. And so all of her women's liberation was to get uh, more power or get away from his power. Whereas we didn't have that issue with you because we haven't been under your control of power since prior to slavery. Now you're talking almost 600 years ago. So we haven't been in that kind of situation. Um, and we were taught, this is important, I think, we were taught to demand things from you to prove your manhood that the white power structure systematically kept you from getting. And so that puts you in a position of not being able to win over us if the basis was going to be if you could provide for us and our children. And so contemporary ideas came in about it. Uh, welfare came in, which allowed you 
as black men to walk away from your responsibility because the white man's welfare system and his food stamps and all of those things, that became our support system. We was married to the government. Mm. They were taking care of us, so they became our man figure. We did what he said to do. We qualified so we could get the benefits, and it allowed you for a long time to not have to deal with your responsibilities of taking care of your children. That was optional. But then by the time the 80s came, 20 years later, the white people had changed their ideas about the requirement because of the financial situation the government was in. So they wanted to punish you further by now demanding that you take care of your children, that you pay them back for any money that they took care of your children with, and that uh, now you owe them. And that gave them some power over you because then they passed laws where they could put you in jail if you did not pay your child support or pay them back for Medicaid, welfare, food mm -hmm. stamps, Section 8, whatever it was. And uh, they have fixed it now, whereas even if you die, they can come in and seize your assets in order to pay themselves back. Now, they're not dealing at all with the fact that it's not us that owe them. They owe us. They owe you. Sure. But because of their refusal to pay us, like they paid other people, the Indians, the Asians, the Jews, they paid everybody in America but us because they think that by giving us the welfare, the food stamps, the unemployment, even all of those things, that that's reparations enough for us. All of this is designed to keep you down. This is designed to repress you. There's not a child on the earth who rejects their father because he don't give them money. There's not a child on the earth, in America especially, where children don't want to be with their father because the mother is fighting with them. A man's ability to see his children or interact with them is based on his relationship with that mother. And most of the men, after you all have children and break up, don't get along with the mother. And then the mother leaves and she go have other men, other boyfriends, whatever she want to do, Claims the child is just hers, her own. White people say, we pregnant, we having a baby. Black women, we say, I'm pregnant, and that's my baby, my son, my daughter. Mm. As if you didn't put it in us, or if we would have never had a child. And so, you know, we do, it's so layered, it's so much. But as I said, we crippled you. We say this, because it's going to come back up. We crippled you, because we didn't tell you who the enemy was. We thought immigration would take care of that as a problem. And especially after we started going to school with little black girls, little white boys, the little uh, white boys and little black girls. Especially after we started interacting, our children did in school. It made our children think that they were equal. So, sister, I'm thinking a lot of people would probably be surprised by quite a bit of the information that you're sharing. So I just played a large chunk of that because I needed you all to get through some of it, right? Like, we, ne we need to get through some of it. So I'm going to be looking this way mostly because I took some notes. And we need to, we need to, do so... I'm going to just call her Miss Ali. It says, the 60s is when it came to a head because white women came up with women's liberation and that black women adopted white women's problem, i.e. wanting liberation from their men. Now, black women have always worked and operated the way they continue to operate. Now, there was never a time, and Miss Ali is right, where black women were under insofar as being covered and protected by black men. I agree with her statement there, except black women did not adopt the women liberation movement. Black women have always been providing for themselves. Now, and their family and men too, let, let's be clear, because as Miss Ali will tell you, the white supremacist system prevented black men from access to employment during Jim Crow, even though we were able to build these black meccas that were then burnt down, right? But she is going to tell you that black men just couldn't do it. And I'm not here to litigate the, the, the validity of that claim. All I'm saying is that black women didn't really adopt women's liberation. Black women have been operating the way they've been operating out of survival. Like, the idea that black women adopted women liberation and not white women adopting black women's experiences without actually going through the trauma and the history, having the history of black women is kind of wild, but I don't want to stay on this too long because there's so much to get through. Black women were taught to demand things from black men to prove their manhood that the white system prevented black men from having. Now, Again, I'm not debating whether or not the white system prevented black men from having certain kinds of access. I believe that's true. That's how white supremacy works. But black women, particularly with children, 
are going to need help. They, they're going to need help. So saying the system made black women want things from black men ignore the reality of a child existing that does need something from the father, unless you don't think the father should be providing anything. Stick a pin there because it comes up again about black men and fathers and them not having to provide financial resources because she brings that up very specifically, which I find absolutely odd. Anyway, let's continue. Black men could not win over black women if they could not provide, right? This is not true, by the way. A lot of black women date a lot of black men who were incapable of providing, but let's just ignore all of that to push Miss Ali's point. So black women should not request things from black men regarding their children, essentially is what I'm getting from this, and that black women demanding anything from black men in terms of financial resources to provide for the child is them playing into white supremacy, so they should just let the man not provide for his children, I'm getting... And you're saying... The white supremacist system at the time prevented black men from being able to provide for their children so they can provide for their children in your mind, by and large. We, as black men in Miss Ali's mind, cannot provide for our children. Then welfare came in and allowed black men to walk away from their responsibility. This sounds like a choice. If Miss Ali is saying that welfare came in and gave black men the ability to, it didn't force them to, she said it gave them the ability to walk away from their families. Um, did they take this? Did they, did they hear, oh, we have an option. Welfare is here to take care of our responsibilities. So now we don't have to, so we're gonna go away and not have to. That does not look right, right? It doesn't seem right that a man given the option to not have to take care of their family and be a father financially will decide, I'm not about to take care of my family financially and I'm also not going to invest in any other way. So that's also a problem. But here's why it's not right and it doesn't sound right. If you were saying black men were prevented from access to resources, particularly finance, then welfare coming in didn't give them an option to either take care or not take care. They couldn't do it. And so the welfare system came in because they, the black man, couldn't do it. You literally, Miss Ali just pointed out that the white supremacist system is making black women demand things from black men that black men can't provide because the white supremacist system prevent the black men from getting access to these kinds of resources. That, so to then say on the back end that the system came in and gave women resources so that black men can choose to be a part of the family and take care of the family or allow the system to take care of it. It's not a real choice because you don't think these men had money in the first place. You don't actually think highly of these men. <laughs> Outside of rubbing their ego, it does not sound like Miss Ali thinks highly of, the, uh, of us uh, as black men. Like, it doesn't sound like she thinks highly of us. Anyway, welfare came and allowed black men not to have to take care of their children, she says. So when given, again, the option to not take care of their children in Miss Ali's mind, black men chose not to take care of their children because you cannot live in the home in their mind because everyone keeps pointing to the man out of the home rule for years in a couple of states, but it has take over the consciousness of black men. A anyway, because you don't live with them don't mean you can't take care of your kids and can't be a father and can't engage with them. So that doesn't really make sense to me. And then she goes into a, a, a spill about in the 80s, the government had financial problems or there was a financial situation. And so the government was forcing black men to pay back the money they paid for these men's children. I don't see a problem with this. I, I really don't. I do not see a problem with this. Now, how you go about doing it, I think should be tapered. She then goes on to describe the fact that black people are owed reparations. And instead of me talking and repeating myself, let me go back to the first video I made because I'm very much pro reparation. But this is a, a sort of clip of the video I made. And I agree with her if this is under the context of or in the context of reparation. After that boy graduates, you get a further incentive if you and the girl marry. If you and the girl marry, we'll give you these incentives, zero finance, home loans, something out of hood the size of an apartment with a leaky faucet. So these men just want people to take care of them. These men just want the government to take care of them. These are not incentives. Just give me money, take care of my child, send me to school. When I come out, if I marry, you give me more money and, and, and opportunities. Okay, I'm fine with this, by the way. This could be a conversation on a reparation. Now, I'm not telling people how to do reparation because in my mind, reparation should be hard cash. Ain't nobody got time for you to do systems and blah, blah, blah. Give these people money. And Jamaicans can go to the UK and get money. But if this was happening, this conversation was happening in um, the context of reparation, it would make sense for you to be demanding to be taken care of. Happening outside of reparation is why. <laughs> so hopefully you heard me talking about sort of, I'm, I am for reparations. However, 
we need to continue the conversation because she didn't just stop there. She said all of this, why right, the welfare system, black women, all of it, is to subjugate the black man. She then explained that there is no child that rejects his father because the father doesn't have money. And I don't agree with this because money itself isn't the issue. It is the ability to provide for the child in a capitalistic society. And if there is a child for which there is no provision, that child will not survive. So the idea that no child is going to be mad at the father for not giving money is besides the point. The child does need these things, money included, to stay alive. So. Anyway, so you should be able to be a father without the financial responsibility, ultimately, is what Miss Ali is advocating for. And I'm not sure why, in a capitalistic system, who should be financially responsible for the child? I actually want to know that. If, if, if you are saying the man should be able to be a father without being financially responsible for the child, who should be financially responsible for the child? I... She then explains that a man's ability to see their child is and interact with the child is dependent on the kinds of relationship that that man has with the mother. I agree with this. If the man loved the mother, the man goes around the child. This is what all the men have been saying. However, if Miss Ali is saying that the woman is keeping the man away from the child, well, you could go to court and fight for custody and around custody. And most courts are leaning towards shared custody. And at worst, you would get visitation. Right? Unless you do something completely horrific and you should not be allowed around your child. Right? So the complaint doesn't make sense here. Right? The complaint literally doesn't make sense. Most men do not get along with the mothers of their child after the breakup, Miss Ali explained. Why? Why? What, what happened? And I feel like this would be a case-by-case -case basis. Again, go to the court if you want to see your child. But the truth is, a lot of these men don't actually want to see their children. And we will get to that in a moment. Because I'm not just saying that to say it. I'm going to provide evidence now because we all talk about this. And I think it's time, again, for us to bring up the real stats around when men decide to not show up for their children. Mothers leave and go with other men and pretend like the child is their own and that the child doesn't belong to the mother and the father. She claims, Miss Ali that is, claims that black women focus on the child is done in a way that excludes the father from any parental right as a cultural dynamic. And I don't agree with this. I think most times the men up and leave or disappear, or they are not as attached to the mother or the child. And that's what results in the absent father or the woman in this way feeling like she is a sole parent. But we'll get to the research on this in a moment that I won't present. If black men put children in you, they are the givers of life. So Miss Ali believes that black men are the givers of life and that we are the seeds of our father. Again, I don't know why people keep doing this because in truth, if the life comes from the men every time you eject... Where are the abortion laws for men who are not... I don't want to describe this. But I feel like men should be arrested for doing anything with this life that they give. If you believe that men give life, you can't be wasting this life. And I'm not going to explain that anymore. Hopefully everyone gets what I'm saying, but I feel uncomfortable continuing this line of discourse. So let's go. She said, we cripple you black men. So the we, I'm assuming, would be black women cripple black men, particularly due to the fight for integration. She, she's blaming black women for integration. Oh, who fought for integration? And I'm not saying black women wasn't a part of the civil rights fight, because obviously they were. There was an agreement. But I mean, who were the leaders in the black civil rights movement? Who were, who, who were the people at the forefront of integration to sit up there and say, black women crippled black men, particularly due to the fight for integration is nasty work. To sit there and blame black women for integration is absolutely disgusting, vile work. If black men are the leaders, how come they did not know what to do about integration and that it would be crippling? Like, I'm so confused as to who the leader, because there's a lot of responsibility being placed on black women and they're not the leader. <laughs> Now, let me go back in time to the, the, the conversation about men, because it seems like Miss Ali, who believes that black women are the ones keeping the father from the, the child, is the problem why the children, black men, grow up 
and don't know anything about the world, right? And she believes that it's not the man's fault, it's due to the fact that women keep these children away from the fathers because they are mad at the father. So let's actually look at the research here, and I've played this before, but let's go to TikTok for this professor to explain it to us. So if we really care about childhood outcomes, we need to be teaching men not to ignore their children the minute a new woman shows up. And even if we just want to focus on improving the outcomes for single mother households, then we need to talk about what causes them, which is absentee fathers. Because absentee fathers are a huge problem. Anywhere between a fifth and a quarter of all fathers have no contact with any of their children. And this is often framed as, oh, my baby mother or my B of an ex-wife doesn't let me see the kids. But that's also not true, because when we look only at men with high levels of custody, 40%, almost half of those who start out with weekly contact, virtually abandon their children within eight years, having little to no contact. And studies have looked into the risk factors for father abandonment and found that once again top of the list is fathers who have a new partner. And if they have a child with that new partner, then virtually all of them abandon their previous children. So the men just want to leave. And when they leave and they show up for the children, so the mother allowed them to show up for the children, they stop after seven, eight years. They, they, they stop showing up, right? And not only do they stop after this time, if they get a new wife, the visitation goes down voluntarily on the man's part. And if they have a new child with this new wife or new girlfriend or new partner, they just completely stop showing up for their previous child. So black women aren't keeping men away. Women aren't keeping men away from their children. Now, there's a conversation about the crack and all of that. I, I, I don't feel like doing it because this video is getting really, really long. So let's jump now then to this section. So it shows up in all of those things. If everybody just go for flip, do whatever, get whatever you can get. And then as more of the child support issue came in, and all of our children want their father mm -hmm. when they're little. Everything you practically know about your father was told to you by their mother because she didn't get along with him. If we didn't get along with the man, then we turned his children against him. If the woman didn't get along with the man, the woman turned the children against the man. Um, how are you going to turn the, the, the child against the man who is the most involved? How are you going to do that? I thought the CDC said, if the men are present, how are you going to turn the child against the man? Aren't we the most involved fathers? Aren't we the most active fathers? How can women turn the children against these men? And it's weird to not even consider the reality that the child growing up with the father never there could turn the child against the father that was never there. How is that not the most obvious response? All right, let's continue. Because Stimpy is gonna talk about how he didn't know that two-parent home was the norm. I remember I didn't even recognize that, you know, a two-family or two a two-parent household was normal. I remember being 16, I had transferred high schools and I, I met a guy, you know, who's now one of my best friends. And uh, we ended up going to a football game, ended up going back to his house after the game and I met his parents. And I, you know, <laughs> we went down to the basement of, you know, some play some video games or something like that. And I remember asking him like, man, you live with both your parents? Mm -hmm. And he just thought that was the funniest thing, but I had never had any friends that had both a mother and a father in the household. And with- know that you're telling the truth because when my son went to jail for being a fool with himself, he said he was the only one in that end of the whole prison, 1,800 men, that had a picture of his mother and his father wow. together. He said that people would come by just to see the picture. Oh, my mom, God. That's your dad? So this is what has been done to all of us, but in particular to our men. Now, that leads us to the next subject, I think, and is that can a black woman or any woman raise a boy into being a suitable proper man? And the answer is no. Over 70% of our black women are single, widowed, separated, or divorced. So that means that over 70% of our men have been raised by women. So it makes you all have the mentality of a woman. Some of y'all stand like a woman. Some of you don't know how to respond in certain situations with other men. It has impacted our entire nice house of having women in charge of things. Because we're emotional, we mad, we disappointed, we lonely, we pretending that sex is all we want to love a man. It's so much nonsense now, it has changed. So all the more ways uh, we have women that don't even teach our children manners. They don't even know how to say thank you if they don't learn it in school. And we shouldn't have to turn our children over to the enemy's educational system in order to educate them about how to live out here. As I said, we did you the greatest injustice by not telling you who the enemy was because we thought it would keep you from getting a job 
We thought it was teaching prejudices. We got prejudging. This is a real situation against you. It's people out here want to kill you every day. When you leave the house, you don't know if you're going to get back. Now do we. Your mothers, your sisters, your aunts, your women. We don't know because we don't know which enemy going to roll up on you and kill you. This ain't fantasy. It's real. Big and facts. If you have sons one day, you'll be sure to tell them what the real situation is. About us living in a, you living in particular in a hostile environment and trying to normalize our captivity. All right. Notes again over here. So I will be looking there. I did not know two parents were normal. You didn't have TV? You didn't, you didn't have TV? What decade were you living in, Stimpy? Did welfare take your father out the home? Have you found a relationship with your father now? By the way, Shaharazad Ali, I said Miss Ali, explained that her son went to prison. So your son with two parents that you were instilling values and you're educating the world. He, he still went to prison with two parents. I thought the two parents issue was the, the issue for these children. But your son went to, oh my God, period. Then she explains that a black woman cannot raise a son into a proper man. If you claim these men are beaten down, they're products of drug use, they have no resources, and they are mental slaves. These are Miss Ali's word. How can they raise a boy into a man? If you've described the sort of uh, pathology in your in black men, by and large, to then suggest that they're the ones who are supposed to be raising, raising these boys is wild. And I do actually agree with some of this. I think there should be a male presence for a boy, particularly if you're thinking about traditional patriarchal values. I don't care about any of that, so it is what it is. But I can understand the inclination there, and I can agree if you want certain set of values, but I don't fully agree. I feel like a woman can read. You know, let me leave that alone because a lot of y'all, the women in here, are going to be mad. Yes, the boy needs a father and all of that. And y'all going to listen to this patriarchal rule about what a man can do and what a woman can. And I'm not about to fight y'all on that. When black men go out, she says, they're fighting the world. We don't know if they will get back. I don't disagree with this necessarily. The problem is who the enemy is. And I feel like a lot of us are unwilling to say who the enemy is. And by enemy, my question becomes very fundamentally, who is unaliving black men? What does the research say about this? Maybe the failure is not telling black men to be weary of the actual enemy, as opposed to telling them to be weary of other systems, which, mind you, I think they sh we should know what the system is. We should discuss white supremacy. I think that is a very important conversation. But I feel like with the rate of homicide, we are doing a disservice by ignoring the intra-culture, intra-racial issues. Y'all remember Myron threatening Ethan? I hope y'all remember that. The, the violence with which a conversation, a debate, rapidly leaned towards because Myron wanted to be face-to-face -face with this man for no reason. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's fine. Ignore it. Now, she talked about her being a leader and the leaders like her, they're aging out, so it is what it is. Let's move on to her ideas around sacrifice and who should be making these sacrifices. Every relationship is a marriage of sorts. And in order to have a marriage that is workable, then you must have some rules and regulations and boundaries. Well, rules and regulations and boundaries are not being taught anymore because nobody's teaching them. The people that's in charge of that, who is the mothers? That's all true about the we, uh, the, what is it, from the cradle and uh, all of that about it take a village? It might, but the village is not prepared. And we are not willing, I think our women today are not willing to make the kind of sacrifices that would have to be made to get our black nation, and we are a black nation within a nation, to get our black nation back on track. And what are those, and I want to get a, a picture of what those sacrifices might look like, by the way. Teaching your children uh, to have manners teaching your children to respect their elders, teaching your children to obey, to eat their vegetables, to in, uh, follow the instructions from the teachers in class, mm. to obey, to do their chores, any instruction. We haven't taught that to our children. And if you don't believe that, go in the grocery store with a young woman with her children and see how savage they are running around and acting like complete fools. And the mother's usually on the phone or something. It don't even matter. 
Mm. Now, I'm not talking about those of us who have tried to improve on our uh, bloodline. I don't mean that. But however, every nation is judged by its worst example. So when people from overseas, as an example, look at the black woman in America, they're not necessarily looking at me or some of the other women that I know. They looking at porn, black women in porn. They looking at today, black women going on the Facebook and the uh, Instagram, shaking their naked behind. Some of my mothers and daughters standing next to each other, shaking their naked behind. This is the desperation that we have and the penalty that we pay for not getting along with you. Understood. So she says, women aren't willing to make the necessary sacrifices to get our nation back on track. What sacrifices, girl? Are men making these sacrifices for relationship to work? What are the sacrifices exactly? Teaching, and, and when asked, she can't actually explain it because she says teaching kids to have manners, respect, obey, eat their veg vegetables. First of all, dads can do this also. It linguistically is odd when you say sacrifice and then go on to list things that are expected of a parent, both mother and father. Those aren't sacrifices, that's what you do when you're a parent. But it feels like she did in fact mean to say sacrifices, she just doesn't feel comfortable explaining what those sacrifices are because what she listed weren't sacrifice. While you're out here, and this is not fully a dig, but like it, it's too obvious to not highlight, your son was locked up. Did you teach him to respect? Did you teach him to be a positive contributor to society? I, I'm gonna leave that alone. I'm gonna leave. Because both you and his dad were there. So. Also, calling kids savages is nasty work, just generally. Like, it should not have happened. And it didn't escape me that she did it. Every nation, she claims, is judged by its worst. You might want to go find out who unaliving people, girl. You... By the way, when I say girl, I need to say this. It's a, a, a natural thing that I do now. I'm not actually calling her, this woman who is my senior, a girl. I would never do that. I, I do this. I, I even do it to men, actually. I, I do it to men. Like, I will say girl um, a, as a punctuation to a sentence when I'm talking to someone, not actually calling someone that. Just an FYI. I realize I've been doing it, and I needed to explain that. The fact that she does not see the transformation of Black women's image that's happening right before our very eyes is ridiculous. Black women's image is now inclusive of going to school and starting business. The bad parts are still there, but to ignore the rest is a choice for someone who does her kind of work. For you to do the kind of work that Miss Ali does and not recognize the transform image makeover that is happening, this transformative makeover that's happening for black women is wild. Like it's absolutely wild. Like you have to intentionally go out of your way to not realize the new stats around black womanhood. In any case, let's move on. But here you stand today. You stand under the power of being in the image of God. I tell black women, it could be the, the closest to God you ever get is being with a black man because you are in the image of God. And that's been the big secret. Mm. It's to make you think that you are less than God and that you had no power, authority or power on the earth. You are in the image of God. You act like God. God made you first. You're the best. You're the wisest. You're the most beautiful. You just been under some people that made you lose your way. And now it's, you have become resistant to resistance because they have used money to define your care. And if you don't have that, they've taught us as your women, they've taught us to judge you by that. As I said, they have made you accountable for delivering things that they wouldn't let you get and still don't. And if you're getting any big money from a white company, you done gave up yourself totally. You don't have mm. no self left if you got a big job with them because the requirement is that you have to give up self. That's a fact. So she says, black men shouldn't get a job, essentially. Like, you can't be telling black men not to get jobs because they shouldn't be working for the white men. Like, why would you? <laughs> but also black women should sacrifice for the men who won't have a job and any finances in a, a capitalist society. Seems wild. This reminds me of the TikTok lady, by the way, talking about black men are the kings, the gods, they are the alphas and the omegas, and they are the best thing in the world. But black men shouldn't work. How will these bills be paid? 
Should all black men become entrepreneur or just work for other black men? And if they can't find a black man to work for, then they do what exactly? By the way, the idea that black men and black men alone are made in the image of God because that's the closest a black woman can get to God is to be with a black man is wild. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Like, I mean, this sounds like some kind of fantasy these people are going through. You are the first, the most beautiful, but you should have resource and you don't need resource because you're the first and the most beautiful and you're God and everyone should bow to you as a black man, but like, you shouldn't provide. That, that seems odd to me. Let's continue, let's continue though. Like there's so much here, but it feels like I can't stay too long here because of so much more that we need to get to. So let, let, let me play this. And the men are different today. You know, men are, uh, have uh, decided in one of the ways that they can get us back for whatever authority we think we have is uh, now they take us out to dinner and don't want to pay for the dinner, get up, walk out. Mm -hmm. Now they come over to our house and want to eat our dinners or be with us and then remind us that now we're not in a relationship. Mm. Because then there's no accountability and you all can do that. You know, so we're living in a time where men also, you all have become more selfish than you've ever been. Because yes. how we have acted and discarded your ego. And because we have felt that we were just free, treat you any kind of way, say anything to you, and that the greatest power we had over you was sex. How important. So she goes on, and you got all of that. And again, note still here. Men are different and don't want to pay now because they want to get back at women. When were they ever able to pay, Miss Ali, based on your recollection? Because you kept pointing out how the issue was that the system required men to pay and then forced them to pay, and when they couldn't, the system controlled them because the system prevented men from having access to resources. So when the system again asked them for money, they did not have it. So now you're saying the reason they don't pay for dates is because they want to get back at women, when it sounds like you've built up everything to point out that they just, we just don't got the money. It's like, you literally just said, we don't have money. It's not the system, like, we don't have money and the system prevented us from getting a job. So like, you can't have that as a reality where we don't have it and even if we wanted to, we wouldn't be able to pay for anything. And also say the reason we don't pay for anything is because we want to get back at women. Like, even if we wanted to get back at women, like, I mean, we don't have any money based on your paradigm. They can't be trying to get back at black women because we didn't have any money, and even if we wanted to get back at black women, it would be irrelevant, again, because we don't have any money. It would be completely irrelevant what we want to get back at and who we want to get back at and for what reason. When we, we couldn't have paid for it, so we don't have the money to withhold. It's like boycotting a business that you don't go to, if you never went to. It's like it's not really boycotting it if you're not withdrawing something that you were giving. You were never giving it. And I'm not saying this is true generally, but like, well, it is true generally, but based on Miss Ali's set up. It, it doesn't make sense to then say, anyway, y'all get what I'm saying. I'm not repeating myself over and over. Blaming women for the leader's faults is also wild. Cannot even hold men accountable for what she see is the issue with men today. She can't even point that out without blaming women for how men are operating because in truth, it sounds like she has a problem with quote unquote modern men and the practices of modern men in their unwillingness to either create and maintain relationships or also pay for dates. Like she has problems around this, but instead of holding the men accountable for their lack of ability to pay for food, which she said they shouldn't have a job, so I don't know why she would be mad at them for not being able to pay for food. But anyway, if you're mad at them, be mad at them. Don't blame someone else for these leaders' inability to lead. Like how are they supposed to be able to afford food when you just told them that they needed to not work for the man, the white man? Well, they paid for dinner during slavery, during Jim Crow. Like, we keep forgetting that black women were maids for, for a lot of families and had to provide for themselves. Like, Miss Ali pointed out that the 1960s welfare was taking them out of their home. What money, girl? What money? I hate the fact that a lot of the conversations around uh, black men, black women, and the reminiscent of around ideas from the 1950s and 60s is done with this illusion of what a black family look like, and then there's an argument from the perspective of this fake family, which didn't exist. It didn't exist for majority of white people. It sure did not exist for black people. The housewife, husband goes to work is not a thing. You cannot create an illusion of a reality in your mind that did not exist and then argue from that place. No. She claims that black men have become more selfish, but then quickly turned it around and on black women. So black men have become selfish, but don't worry about that because it's not your fault that you are now selfish. It's a black woman's fault. 
So let me know not to be blamed for anything, even in her mind, their own behaviors. And it's interesting because she's talking about black men being selfish and not wanting to commit and leaving women and all of that, and it's the black woman's fault. But like, it's not only done to black women, it's kind of done to all races of women. And if you're blaming black women, you run up against the reality that black women, when they date out, tend to be more successful in terms of staying together than black men. So it's like, it's a hard sell. Miss Ali, that's a, that's a hard sell. But let's continue. Let's continue the conversation, shall we? How important is, because you're right, I do see, and I have been that brother, that's also being very selfish and over-communicating where we stand, which ain't no relationship. About the self that's right. So, so this man just admit that he was the bad guy. He over-communicated where they stand because he didn't want to be in a relationship. Her response, essentially, it's fine. She, bl she blames women for men's bad behavior, so he gets to admit that he was the bad guy because women set the culture, but he's somehow the leader. He is a leader, but he behaved badly because women created the cult. All right, girl, let's hear the marriage question. Let's hear the marriage question. I want to ask this here because how important is marriage to us getting our community to the next level and us rebuilding our community, how important of a piece does marriage play in that? Well, I think that the marriage license is just proof of a long-term, a steady relationship and of unity of trying to work together. So the piece of paper for marriage is, uh, doesn't have any more value than if a couple is together and sharing their resources and their food and uh, trying to build a family together with a mother and a father. We didn't make up the system of marriage that is practiced today in America. And it's been very difficult. It's, di it's difficult to get along with anybody. As I said, every relationship, look at it as a marriage and see what the standard and quality is of that relationship. We have terrible issues that were put in us. Envy and jealousy, mm. insecurity, all of those things, and the evil of poverty. Mm. It's evil. Indeed. It's very hard to deal with it. That everybody who's got a bad credit rating are ashamed of that in secret. Mm -hmm. We're embarrassed about that. We don't want to talk about it with nobody. And we have done those things and we're in that group. But credit wasn't our idea anyway. <laughs> right, right. Now, I, I want to talk to you about... Things have been forced on us and we have tried to live under them because we think it'll make us uh, unpopular if we go with our own idea. We think we'll be ostracized. And that's one thing I really try to teach my children and grandchildren. Be yourself. You be you. So you heard the full question, how important is marriage? Why would you ask her this question when the lady, she literally very specifically told you that every relationship is a marriage and she doesn't care too much about quote unquote marriages in the formal sense. She said this in the beginning of the conversation. So you either weren't listening or understanding what it is that she was saying to then ask her if marriage is the what we need to solve and how important is marriage? Why would you ask her that when she literally told you in the beginning? I don't like this. I don't like people who have conversation and don't actually engage with what was said, remember it, and then integrate it into whatever question they're going to pose later. It's like you have a set of questions and you, by God, you're going to ask these set of questions regardless of if these questions were previously answered. Like what's the utility of repeating questions to which she already answered? If she believes every relationship is a marriage, she cares more about kind of the, the inner working of the relationship as opposed to the marriage as an institution. It's very obvious from everything that she said. You, oh my God. Anyway, she also talked about love and what you need to do and she said to be yourself. And I keep remembering her child and I don't know why because I usually don't think about stuff in this way, but it's weird to say be yourself. Well. If you were going to go to prison for being yourself, you probably shouldn't be yourself and just be a better person. <laughs> now let's hear why men can't lead. You be you. It don't matter who everybody else is. I'm not trying to raise no followers. I'm trying to raise leaders. Mm -hmm. And most of our men can't lead in their own house mm. because we think we're smarter than y'all. Men cannot lead because women think they are smarter. Um, do women think they're smarter? Does the research bear this out? <laughs> because like, the research does say men develop slower than women. I feel like that might have something to do with it. The research says that men are unable or unwilling to access certain kinds of emotion and investigate it deeply. We don't have jobs. 
a lot of us can't read or comprehend generally. There's this idea about the prison industrial complex and how much of us are getting trapped up in there, the lack of education, violence. I think there's a reason why we cannot lead or we've not been leading, right? And I don't think it's just because women think they're smarter. It's just because they're going to school. You're up there, wrong as you are, Miss Ali, in my mind, but you're up there schooling Ren and Stimpy. Like you're schooling them right in front of you is an example of why women are viewed as smarter than, than, than men. You're like an example of that in that interaction with them two men. They have not provided any substance while you are there, even in their questioning, outside of giggling because you are deciding to rob and validate their ego. They don't care. What leader? You are the leader currently in that engagement, not them. So men's value and money. Now you mentioned, cause you know, sticking along the lines of credit and finances, right? Because I know you talked about, you know, how a, a man's value is seen by how much money he can earn. And I think it's not just women who see that. I think men, we've adopted that as well. Like if there's a guy not getting money, we saying the same things that women will say about this particular, you know, these particular guys. And uh, it just seems to be a lot of confusion. I'm confused myself. So help, help me to, to understand better. Where does a man's true value come from? So she says, man's value as money, where does a man's true value come from is what the, the young man wanted to know. They should be good. <laughs> it should be good. Because Stimpy out here asking, where does man value come from? Mind you, we know he's confused. He says, I am confused. And I'm glad like he admits what we all kind of already know. The lady literally said that a man needs to teach another man how to be a man. And she's explaining that men need to help other men find their value and their manhood or whatever. But you thought it was a good idea to ask her who just told you that men need to lead and teach men how to be men. You thought it was a good idea to ask her what is your value as a man. And she not, the funny thing is, she's not about to explain to them that they need to find men to tell them what the value is. She's going to attempt to tell them what value is. And that's the wild thing. Because she, she already explained that that's not her place. In any case, let's hear her answer. <laughs> it comes from his behavior and ability to love and forgive. Mostly us, because we have led you to all, as I said, 75% of the men in America raised by a woman mm. who is man and a man. So we put that in you. Some of y'all ain't never even been around your father, but you know you hate him. So your value comes from your behavior. It comes from you helping maybe your parents, being respectful to other elders, helping somebody if you can, trying to take charge of certain situations in your home. Don't let your baby's mother rest your little girl like a little whore. Don't let your baby mama put weaves in your daughter's hair because that's teaching her that the only way she can be beautiful is if she buys some fake material and glue it on her head. Mm -hmm. They come from another race of people to all ages. So we don't need to teach that. We don't need to take our little girls and start putting them on makeup, letting them wear thongs, shorts, halter tops. You men know you don't like that. Every father don't really like that. Uh -huh. Not at all. So we need men who will speak up about that. Like I say, we've tricked y'all on that, that this is my baby stuff. And um, so if you're not in it, and I know it's hard to try to be with your child if the woman don't want you around. You got to go through big mama and auntie you know, it's still, yeah, right. you got to go through so many people and get accepted or approved of just to see your own child sometimes. And while we do need financial help to take care of our children, it should not be the only criteria that we use in allowing the father to be around the child. Now, I'm not talking about the crazy men out here or the crazy women. I don't mean people that's just out of their mind, a danger to society and themselves and you and everybody. I mean those who are trying to be normal, who are trying to be decent and clean and set a good example. We already know the children don't do what you told them. They do what they see. So if we have a mother who is modeling fake hair down to her back, all the way down to her knees sometimes, if she is modeling fake eyelashes, if she is modeling fake dresses and BBLs, red lips, all of these things that we do in self-worship, long fingernails, long toenails, everything that we do in self-worship, trying to look like somebody else, mm. or trying to improve on what is already perfect. We're the most beautiful women on the planet. And you are the most wonderful, the maker, the owner, cream of the planet Earth, God of the universe. That's how you like God. God made you in his image and he made you first. He didn't make everybody else and they make you. You're the best. That's not to make you have a bravado or over uh, 
thinking or ego tripping or something. It's just because you don't know to try your best or that you have a choice to be your best. So you don't find nothing of yourself because everybody around you hates you. Your mama hates you. Your sister hates you. Your neighbor hates you. The school hates you. You work at home in life and we don't think about that. Y'all have a hard time. And who can you turn to about it? Not anybody you feel like you can trust. Mm -hmm. The trust has been broken. But it's your decision. The brain ain't telling you what to do. You telling the brain what to do. You the God. It's your universe. And you can repair it yourself into that idea. So she's talking, talking, talking. This comes from their ability, our ability to love and forgive. What's the behavior she's talking about? Not sure, but I feel like I need to play Akon. I need a, remember when Akon was on Joe Biden and talking about how women were imbued with the ability to love and show compassion as if men weren't? Like, but... Miss Alice Cooking, she said that we, we, uh, we meaning black women in her mind, have led y'all um, astray because black women raise 75% of the children by themselves. So women are to be blamed for how these men are raised. But like the CDC said that y'all were the most involved fathers. So like, wait. <laughs> And also, even later, I'm joking about the CDC because that's not what it actually said. It said when black men are involved, and that's a huge caveat. But it doesn't actually matter. I, I don't care about any of that, right? It's wild to blame the person who stayed around and raised the child for the developmental issues, maybe, that the child might have. When we all know the absence of a parent actually caused a tremendous amount of harm to children, to to ignore that, I think, is criminal in terms of discussion around childhood development. I think that is criminal. She said, some of y'all haven't even been around your fathers, but you know you hate him because you heard it poison coming from your mother. And this statement is wild again because we've discussed how your absence could be the catalyst for bad feelings towards you. And that's the most obvious answer. She then goes into this spill about don't let your baby mother dress your child like this or that. And it's like, well, you would have to be there to prevent them from doing it. You would have to care to prevent them from doing it. She talks about how everyone hates a black man, which is wild. Your parents hate you, this hate you, that hate you. And it's like, have you seen these celebrities, Taraji and all of them talking about how they love the black man and making documentaries about the black man and how the community rallies behind these sentiments to, to not acknowledge the fact that black men are revered in the black community generally and cared for and loved by black women is wild. Black women aren't the ones unaliving black men again. It's funny because I would play a bunch of videos and point out in the comments and all the likes to dislike ratio around black men getting praised and black women fighting for black men and all of that, but I'm not gonna do it. I think we all know it, and this is a definite lie that I don't need to engage with any further. So let's talk about empowerment and affirmation. It's so powerful, it's just, it's very strange to me because you're dropping these affirmations and I'm, I feel myself getting excited and, and empowered and empowered right. and emotional. And I'm thinking in my mind, you know what? I need, I need this sister like with me, like I need to be, she needs to be right here with me. And I, I think a, a lot of women are confused because the value they put in, they are working sacrificially for these corporations and they are presenting it like, Hey, this is how I get my power. This is, this is what makes me powerful. Yeah. So, so, so let me ask you what, what, what is a woman's true power? Like what makes a woman powerful? What should she be working to? hone and embrace so she can feel just as successful and confident that she feels when she gets that promotion or that, that bigger check at her, at her job. Heaven, we are in charge of heaven for the black man. And we can make heaven or we can make hell. If we make heaven, we'll have a better outcome. The only way we're gonna have a better people is we as black women burst them out of my womb. Everybody gotta come out of here. And we have power even then because we decide who's gonna come out and who we gonna put off and kill. Mm -hmm. So we have a great deal of power, but I always say we just using the power in the wrong direction. We are using it to destroy ourselves. Our birth rates are down. So it ain't just a white man who got a lower birth rate. Mm -hmm. Ours are because of abortion and birth control, homosexuality and sickness. So, you know, we, we decide how long this other power we have, we decide how long you gonna live. So, <laughs> 
They're getting empowered by her being there, no doubt. I believe them fully. They said they need her around to boost their ego and let them know that they're God and they're powerful and all of that. Completely ignore wages. I hate having to work too, so let, let, let's skip that. What is a woman's true power to make her feel accomplished like when she got that promotion is his question. The question is a leading one, right? It is the absolute worst form of questioning where the first part and the setup of the question is completely disjointed from what is actually being stated. So the setup implies that there's something wrong with the way women are working for corporation and not being as dedicated to the men. And not that necessarily it's wrong to work for the corporation, but you should be able to do it for your man. Who said that? One of those things you're getting paid for, the other you are not. What do you mean? I keep reminding y'all we're in a capitalist society. To not acknowledge that is wild. Until you change the system, it is what it is around work and pay. Men and women are sacrificing for the cooperation. It is what it is. If we change that, then we change that. And Miss Ali goes on to explain that black women can need to make heaven for men and that they need to make heaven and make a decision because they have the power through their womb to decide what comes out and what doesn't. This is creeping very closely next to Sinji about the women's power to dictate how the community will be by choosing to have children and not have children. It is, and I know she does not agree with Finn. And so hearing her say this, like you can't blame women for not having abortion while blaming them and yelling at them for having abortion and then saying they have the power within them because of have the ability to have children and carry children out into the world. You can't tell them they have that power and then be mad at how they decide to use it if it ends in the result that you want. Like, don't tell people they have power, but then say don't use it. And you can only use it in this specific way. If they have the power, they have the power. It is wow, because for me, I don't agree with this sentiment because well, I mean, you can decide who to give birth to. That's not what I disagree with. I disagree with the notion that black women should be blamed for the community because they have these kids. Like, no, like the father who left, the adult who engaged in the terrible action should be blamed for their terrible action. So yeah, I just, I, I, I don't like this, this. Anyway, she talked about her birth rate and she pointed out how it's going down due to abortion and homosexuality, etc. Forget the birth rate. People who are alive are being unalived. Are we going to talk about that or not? At, at no point has she brought up the, the, the unalizing rate in the black community. I wonder why. Because she keeps talking about the numbers dwindling and she's not really talking about why the number is dwindling. <laughs> just, just wild stuff. Let's watch some more. About what we feed you? Well, look at this. What's this thing's like? And how much stress we put on you? See, we put a lot of extra stress on our man. You already got stress up under the enemy. So it make it really hard for you to heal from anything because we turn on you so fast at the first disappointment. Yeah. So we have got to continue to, to try to provide heaven. See, we do obey you. And I talk about submission. I introduced that in society. <laughs> right. And you know the issues that that has brought up. Both, both submission and cooperation, big issues. Yes, yeah, it's the same thing. Uh, we do have one time when we do agree with you we follow instructions, we obey, and we submit. And that's NB. It ain't nothing you can tell us to do that y'all tell us to do. We won't try to do it and do it worse. <laughs> <laughs> that's we follow everything you tell us. It ain't nothing you can tell us that we say, no, I ain't doing that. Uh-uh, we do that. But once we all stand out and get out to bed, oh, hell, it rock. It all comes back. It all comes back to you and tell me what to do. Why don't you step up like a man? How do our girls know what it's like to step up? How do a woman know what it's like to step up like a man? Now, many of us have had good fathers, and so we saw different things that they did. But a father's place in the home is not just to provide financial support. And many of our women think that it is because we want so many material things that we don't make anyway. We ain't gonna make no money off of it. She, she says black women put a lot of extra stress on <laughs> Black women put a lot of extra stress on black men. He, she said black women turn on black men fast. Women should continue to provide heaven for black men. Black women should submit. Only time women submit is in the bedroom. Step up like a man. Um, the father's role is not just to provide financial support. Black women want so many material things. And I'm sitting here like, what? Who put extra stress on black men? You say black women turn on black... 
I feel like as a collective, the fact that black women are being unalived and still supporting black men is wild, black femicide. Let's not use unalived rate and we can even talk about who the, who get, who dates out more, who is more loyal to whom when black men are dragging black women online. Like, it doesn't make sense that she believes black women to, I don't know why I'm treating this with any kind of legitimacy. Hey everyone. Um, so I lost a lot of my footage. I lost a lot of my footage. And instead of doing a voiceover, I decided to just come back and you all deserve the very best. Anywho, it did not escape me, mind you, that they were trying to say corporation and submission are the same thing. Y'all should get a dictionary because they are not. To submit to something or someone is very different than to cooperate with someone. I don't, we're not doing that. Grab a dictionary, go to Google. I'm not even gonna define either here because I think that it would be very problematic. I will not treat the audience as children. I can't do that. So if you think corporation and submission are the same thing, uh, absolutely not. That is definitely not the case. <clears throat> Separately, I will clarify again. I think being a father is more than finances. That is, it is finances plus more. I think being involved with your child, hanging out with your child, raising your child, um, teaching your child how to be a productive member of society, loving your child, caring for you. Look, I'll, I'll just keep going. Yes, I do think being a father is more than finances, but you should also be providing resources for your child to survive. And in this world, we measure that, fortunately or unfortunately, by how much money you can contribute a lot of the time. And if you can't do that much financially, that's unfortunate. Hopefully you make up for it in other areas of the child's life, but we would expect finances, child support. <laughs> anyway, let's continue. But I actually want to talk about something that you spoke about in your book as well, because, you know, in the book, you pretty much made this comment where you say, hey, look, if look, men, before it's black men, before y'all think about leaving and dating outside your race, I need you to understand this. It was, it was like a call to the attention. Mm -hmm. And first of all, before I even go into that, what do you think about a man's psyche, where it is, for considering dating outside his race? Do you feel like he's wrong for that? Do you feel like that's the wrong way to think about it? Or is it okay to, you know, open your options and just be open to love in whatever shape or form it comes in? So I'm cutting in right here to analyze the question. Instead of asking, should a man date outside of his race? The question is framed as, because of the things we're going through in the community, can you explain the man's psyche as to why he would want to date outside of his race? The, the premise for which the question relies is not something she accepts, right? And so the framing of this question is very specifically pro-interracial dating, which, look, love who you love. But it's a weird way to position this. And my only sort of thought, and maybe this is not the most good faith approach when I, I'm thinking about what he's intending to do, but from my perspective, it feels like he is trying to get her to justify why men, black men would want to date out of their race and blame black women for why black men would want to date outside of their race. That's uh, the, the vibe I got from the premise on which the question he's asking rely and his intentional buildup into a question as opposed to asking outright, should black men date outside of their race and getting Miss Aliyu's response. So that's, that's the thought. All right, let's hear the answer. It's never okay. It's never okay to date outside your race, okay? There's 4 billion, 400 million people on the earth. It's 50 million or so black people here in America. So I don't see no reason how you can't pick somebody out of 40 and 50 million. Mm. And people hit the lottery every day, but you gotta play, you gotta be in it. And so no, of course people wanna date outside their race. So that's all, the people ain't been through what we've been through. Mm. They don't really know us. We can go in there pretend to be anybody we want to and they'll think it's a novel. Oh, he's black. I couldn't believe these shocking facts about women and money. Get this, women anybody we want to, and they'll think it's a novel to what we've been through. Mm. They don't really know us. We can go in there and pretend to be anybody we want to, and they'll think it's a novel. Oh, he's black. Yeah, and, and y'all can have any one of us that you want. That's the other thing. It ain't no woman out of reach. Okay. Women leave their big successful husbands for the draft cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> the lawnmower. You know, the wheel. it's all fake. And you need to be able to get your heart on so you can see through that. It's all fake. We're not hard to be with or whatever. 
how we're desperate and we're lonely. Mm. And that's your fault. And so that desperation has driven us to do so many horrible things. Sex has been so distorted among uh, our black youth, I'm going to say. And I don't know how long that youth, my age, that would go to. Yeah, right. Distorted. Anytime we can decide as a people that it's normal to define sex as speaking in somebody's mouth, choking them, slapping them, or licking them in their rectum. And this is what our young people are practicing. I'm mentioning it. It's a filth, but it has to be mentioned. We have to know what this society and us have allowed to be produced in our children. During the Vietnamese Vietnam War, they would take their BM, put it in a bowl, and stick their arrows in it. Maybe it was something else, I don't know, and twist the arrows around and then shoot at the Americans with it because it would make them deathly ill, sick, and sometimes kill them. Mm. So how have we produced children who think that tossing salad as Chris Rock did <laughs> is normal? And it's something to do that's connected any kind of way. You know, they urinate on each other, just doing everything and calling that sex. So we didn't get certain information out there. Well, we were wrong. All that knocking each other's back out. That's not how that's supposed to go. So, so I mean, how do we, how do we, we fix this though, you know, at, at this point? Because obviously, you're very big on us fixing our homes and our families. Yeah, you, have to, you have to uh, lead by example. You have to let your community see what righteousness looks like. You have to let the community see that your presence is making a difference. And then you have to separate from people who are negative. You know, some of the ex-slaves, and that's all of us, we all got PTSD, every one of us. If we could separate ourselves from the enemy, from his authority in your life, he don't have some authority because we haven't taking any instructions about doing anything for self. But if we could separate a lot of what we do from them, and if we could teach our children, you know, we talk this African-American stuff, and we African-American and all of that. Mm. So I strongly disagree on one end and then very much disagree on another end, and then in the middle there are some issues, right? I agree that we should lead by example. I don't think that's exclusive to men and black men in particular. I think people should live what they preach and preach what they live. And I think the best way to get people and your children to do that which you're telling them to do is by modeling the behavior that, that, you, that you're showing them. However, her discussion on interracial marriage and her dislike for it around black men dating out is because there are so many black women that are available and willing and that black women will date any black man essentially because he, she has seen black women leave their successful black man for the dry cleaners. Right. And black women are desperate. <clears throat> I, I am struggling to reconcile this position with her earlier position about black women wanting too much and that black women need to settle and they're putting too much pressure on black men to do and be more while simultaneously saying that black women will take any kind of black man, which is statistically more in line with the reality around black women dating down. I am not sure how she is able to hold these two positions, chastising black women for wanting too much, doing too much, demanding too much, and siding and leaving black men and degrading black men and not dating black men and not truly wanting to love and care for black men, while also saying black men shouldn't have to leave the community because black women will take any black man and in fact will leave rich men to be with black men who have no resources. Those positions are contradictory. If the first is the reality, then one would understand why black men would leave if black women don't want them. But if the second is true, where black women want black men and will accept any black man essentially, regardless of financial position, then her argument doesn't work at all. When you say in the beginning, again, a verbatim, women only see men as resources, women only see men as financial resources, black women only see black men as financial resources, these were her words, that is her claim, to then say black women will date black men who are poor and have nothing to give them, when it suits your argument, it doesn't seem principle. It doesn't seem principled to say they only want money when you're saying they would date broke men. So I, I'm repeating this because I, I know you all already get it, but I'm trying to, in a, in a good faith way, reconcile the two position, and I am incapable right now of doing that. And I've thought about it. You see, I've, I've changed clothes. So I left, came back. It's still a contradiction. 
women being desperate in her mind in this new answer, desperate people aren't the best at negotiation around what it is that they're desperate for. And that's why you don't engage in negotiation when you're desperate, because you'll take anything you can get. Those aren't demanding people, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Like, uh, that's what people aren't the most demanding. And she quickly pivots from a conversation about interracial dating to what I consider to be xenophobia. And I'll explain. This is where I fundamentally, fundamentally disagree with. She, in this way, discusses the difference between Africans and African Americans. I don't know if I will include her full statement, but in response to this, and I won't, I, I, I won't drag, so to speak. I feel fortunate to one be black, but two also have a lot of black friends all over the world, and I hold no animosity towards them, and I don't think they hold any towards me. And I again feel fortunate that I live in a world where this can happen, and the the sort of other disrespect of people because of where they come from, I find that to be abhorrent. The xenophobic leaning she has is very new to me. I don't know why, maybe everyone else knew that, but I, I understand her sort of misogyny and leaning into pa black patriarchy in that way, but I didn't understand the sort of xenophobia. This is like my first exposure to it. This video, not right now, but this video. I kind of assume people like her and the Dr. Umar Elk had reverence for Mother Africa. So uh, this, this is kind of new to me. Uh, I won't analyze it in any further depth. I'll just kind of move on from it. They all over the time. Change don't mean better. Change means different. And if it's different, we can make it different again into what we need it to be. But what does it bring? You have to be really brave to pick up any of these banners I'm talking about and try to do it to work for the salvation of our people and your future scene. Many of our men, they don't know what their father was going through. Look how hard it is today, all the black men trying to survive, trying to help take care of a woman, her other children, and his self. Look how hard that is. And many of you are making four, five, six, seven hundred dollars a week. Well, imagine back in the day when men were making a hundred dollars a week and had those same responsibilities pressed on you. You don't know what happened between your mother and your father, because we ain't gonna tell y'all that. Because we feel like that is not your business. However, we make you pay for it by separating you from the person we made it with. Now I have this other project out now of black men need to be taught to play with dolls. Black boys, I mean, need to be taught to play with dolls. Little girls, babies, bottles, diapers, change them and do all of that. Now, aside from the fact that we have the greatest number of single fathers that we've ever had, we need to be teaching the boys fatherhood like we teach the girls motherhood. I think I'm going to end this here and, and conclusion, because, mm, no. The agreement here is, I do agree that black men should, black boys should play with dolls and be taught what it means to be a father and have that ingrained in them from childhood. The detachment from children, I think, starts in childhood for men who do not feel an obligation to, to care for, for children. But I feel like that only underscores the reality of black men's absence, where she completely ignores, Miss Ali completely ignores. So I, I'm not sure why that is, but I guess she could have just pulled up the CDC in response to me after she so eloquently explained why black men as children, as boys, should be playing with dolls so that they can get attached to the idea of having children. But I'm sure when faced with that, she's going to say the CDC said we're the most involved fathers, right? So in any case, let's continue. Black men are trying to survive, trying to help take care of a woman and the children and himself. Wait. <laughs> sorry, sorry, wait. <laughs> sorry, I'm trying to do the W-H-E-T because like, I'm very concerned with this statement. You're telling black men that they need to be playing with dolls as children so that they can get more connected to their children. You're talking about men not being in the home. You're talking about women wanting more things from men and pushing men away and their absence is causing issues in the home where the woman is leading the home. This is a dynamic of single motherhood where the absent father is not present. That's what, what this all means. So to then say men are out here struggling to survive, to take care of themselves, the woman and the children is nasty and diabolical work. It is, because it is not in alignment with the reality you created about what is happening in the black community. And to, to pretend like this is going on is diabolical. It is a choice. It is an intentional choice to lie. Like, 
It has to be an intentional choice to lie because I can say this is not principled. It doesn't fall in alignment with any of the conversation that was happening. It doesn't fall in alignment with her arguments that she's making. It does not fall in line with the paradigm she's created. So to then sit there and say that men are surviving because they're trying to provide for themselves and the children and the woman. I don't know where you're getting that from. You said these kids don't even like their fathers because of the mom like, talking about their dad in a, in a terrible way. But if the CDC is correct and they're there, couldn't they just correct the language around them themselves? Like, if you're there, someone says something that's not true to your child, you get to correct it. I, I don't know. If you are blaming women for how boys are becoming men, how are they, the men also involved? Because like, shouldn't they, like you were saying men should raise boys, but then you're mad that the woman is by herself raising the boys as opposed to the man who should be there helping to raise boys. While the men are struggling to provide and take care of these boys, but you're blaming the mother for how these boys are raised while trying to pretend that the dad is there. If the dad is there, you need to blame the dad or both parents, right? But you can't say the dad is there struggling, trying to take care of the family and the children, but blame the mom for the boy not being a good man when he grows up. Or the dad is not there and the mom is struggling to raise the boy and you're ignoring the absence of the father. Like, it is obvious to me, and I'm glad this is a conclusion, because it's obvious to me that Miss Ali, Shahzad Ali, is not there to give truth, but to placate. Tweedledee and Tweedle. These two men have highlighted throughout the conversation that they love how they feel talking to her. She's making them feel good. Victimhood feels good for a lot of people. So I'm not saying they're wrong for how they feel, but it makes sense because she's there to placate them, and apparently it's working. She does not respect, in my mind, black men and the power that black men would have and can have. Rather, she's trying to turn all of the issues into, from my perspective, a black woman's problem. So black women will be tasks, tasked with uplifting black men and carrying black men to the finish line. Because she even told them, literally in this video, that they don't need to work. That they, no, mischaracterizing of mischaracterization of what she said. She said you shouldn't be employed by the white power structure. <laughs> yeah, period. Throughout this, there is a reference to sort of post-traumatic slave syndrome and that black men are broke and also broken. And that's why they are not as attached. And if we were, as black men, able to be taught better and be better, then we would show up better. This I agree with. However, you have already told us that we are not. And then to suggest that we should, in our broken state, be leaders of home and raising children, it seems wild if you're not first correcting the brokenness. Like, before we even attempt to lead or dictate, we first have to heal and be better in some ways before we take the mantle of leadership, if we are to take the mantle of leadership, which I don't believe by virtue of being men and black that you are in charge or supposed to lead anything. I'm sorry. Like... I've seen too many great women leaders to just assume blackness and maleness makes one a leader. So we can move on from that. She claims women separate men from their children, and this is just not true. We've already discussed this earlier around men voluntarily deciding to detach from their children. And when they have a new family, a new wife, and a new baby, they choose not to engage anymore with the child that they are absent from the home with. Telling men they are God is an ego driven approach to motivation. You cannot tell us, black men, that we are gods and then tell us not to be egotistical. What do you mean? <laughs> like, what do, you, what do you mean? Unless you can explain how we are God, you, you don't get to say that as a Christian. Th that sounds wild to me. I will close on something that I agree with. And I've never thought about it until she said it. And I think most men will claim this as weak and feminine and that you shouldn't do it. But I do agree with her on this, that you should have men as boys play with dolls. I think that's something we should deeply investigate and think about. I think that would be a really, really good idea. And I think investing in, in, in childhood that way, yeah, black men's childhood that way, and having create an attachment to children and family from such a young age, I think would do wonders psychologically for black men and, and men generally. Getting people to do that, getting both mothers and fathers to agree that young boys should play with dolls as their babies, 
we'll see how that goes because I don't foresee the culture accepting that. So I, th this wasn't good. <laughs> The video wasn't great. It was a terrible interview. I don't appreciate people just placating their audience. I think truth does not have to be hard and vicious and unkind, but it should be told. And her unwillingness to tell men the truth is a problem. So this is where I'm going to end this video. I hope you all enjoyed, if not the video, because I, I didn't enjoy the video I was watching from Ren and Stimpy, but I hope you would appreciate the commentary. I will see you all later. Remember to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Bye.